Hi Grace Church, great to be back with you today. And I'm going to be preaching about the power of Pentecost. And uh, we're going to be looking at some passages out of the book of Acts. So why don't you turn in your Bible there and you can follow along with me. First of all, we're going to look at Acts chapter 1 and from verse 4. And so today, we're, this is a two-part series. And uh, I'm really looking forward to sharing this with you. And I pray that it stirs your heart and would provoke you into a greater sense of renewal and even revival. So let's get started. Acts chapter 1 verse 4. Jesus gave this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is verse 8. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Hop down now to Acts chapter 2. And from verse 1 it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were praying. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. They said, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Hop down to verse 12. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Verse 13, Somehow, some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this uh, to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this was, was what was spoken by the prophet Joel, who said, In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Wow, what amazing scriptures. I, they just stir my heart just reading about them. But Pentecost, what's it all about? Well, for us in the church, it's 50 days after we remember the death of Jesus and his resurrection at Easter, or what the Jews referred to as Passover. Pentecost Sunday is the next celebration in the official church calendar. When I was growing up, I thought Pentecost Sunday had something to do with being Pentecostal, and so I sort of disregarded it. But in reality, it has little to do with that because it was well known in the Jewish calendar well before that time. Pelikos celebration existed in the Jewish calendar from the days of the children of Israel coming into the promised land. Pentecost is the Greek name for the Feast of Weeks, which simply means 50 days. Those 50 days came from seven weeks and one day after the Passover. Uh, it's a prominent feast in the um, religious calendar of Israel, celebrating the giving of the law on Sinai by Moses, but also the first fruits of crop harvest, which happens from April through to June. We read about Moses receiving the law in Exodus 19 and 20, with fire and signs and wonders resting on Mount Sinai, um, what, which occurred seven weeks after the Passover, or the 50 days since the angel of death passed over Egypt. And then the children of Israel rose up that, that very evening, that night, and came out of Israel. They effectively came out of their time of bondage and they came into the worship uh, to worship God at Mount Sinai in freedom. This feast is still celebrated in Judaism and it's called Shavuot. As at Shavuot, the Jews celebrate the law, become, law and them, a one people, becoming a nation with God as their ruler and king. No longer Pharaoh who enslaved them, and they committed themselves to serving God according to his ways and laws. 
Hence then, it's no coincidence that Jesus died at Passover to save us from the bondage of sin and death and to come away from the ruler of this world who we know is Satan. Then at Pentecost, 50 days after his death and resurrection, he sends the Holy Spirit with tongues of fire resting on people's hearts, which was a clear sign uh, of his presence with his people. This was the beginning of the new kingdom where the church was born as the first fruits of a world harvest and the Holy Spirit being poured out upon all people. From this point, we, we become, that, that is, those who are in the church, become the citizens of a new kingdom under the lordship of Jesus Christ in his rule of love and grace. No longer are we slaves, but now we're the sons of God. No longer following laws on stones carried by Moses down that hill, but now we have the law of God written on our hearts, as Jeremiah 31, 33 says. No longer are we worshippers in fear, fearful of coming near to God, but we are worshippers in freedom and in love, as 1 John 4, 18 says. We no longer live to the external conformity, but now live in the freedom of the Spirit. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Officially, Pentecost, as I said, is celebrated next week on the 31st of May. But I want to look at this topic for the next two weeks as we approach this important day in the church calendar. And I believe God, as I said earlier, that God will use it to stir our hearts so that we can be renewed and ignite a revival fire in our hearts. So what can we learn from this mighty birthing of the church at Pentecost? And what does it mean for us personally? Well, number one, we receive a person of promise at Pentecost. We receive a person of of promise. Acts chapter 1 verse 4 says, Jesus gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. You know, people get caught up in denominational doctrine that limits and boxes in God and tries to explain him rationally and logically. Or people get confused that Pentecost was for a special few at a one-off time and place and they write off all future relevance. Doing this, though, they're disregarding what Peter said, the apostle, in Acts 2, 38 to 39, which he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all those who are far off, for whom the Lord our God will call. Hey, friends, that's you and me. We're the ones who are far off. And so that same Holy Spirit promise is for us. But Pentecost is about the person of God as a promised gift to us who believe for back then and for now. And so uh, looking then at Acts 1 verse 4, we we can see that in this verse, we actually have the uh, the whole Godhead at work. It's the Trinity present, uh, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And Pentecost is about an encounter actually with the fullness of God, the Trinity of God. Jesus, the Son of God, says, My Father, God, has promised to give you the Spirit of God. And this is the fulfillment of numerous um, prophecies and promises made by God, and most notably through the prophet Joel, hundreds of years before, where he said, In the last days, God said, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Now, this is not some optional extra that, oh, well, we can just take or leave Holy Spirit. No, the person of the Holy Spirit is essential for our Christian journey. He is a gift from the Father and he's guaranteed by the Son. You need, I need the person of the Holy Spirit. Have you met him? That's my question for you today. You might say, oh, don't give me any of that weird stuff. Just give me Jesus and I'll be all right. No, there's no splitting hairs here. You want God, then you get Holy Spirit. As Jesus said, don't leave town till you've met him and filled by him. It's not enough to say you believe in the principles and the ways of God. You need to have met God and be filled to overflowing. How do I know? Well, from the testimony of scripture and from my own testimony. We can see, uh, if we go through the scriptures, we can see some very clear examples that 
God wanted this to be a pattern that as when we believe, we then to um, be prayed for to receive the Holy Spirit. And so when Philip went to Samaria in Acts chapter eight, and he went to a people that were caught up in with with a sorcerer, Simon, and and they uh, weren't following God. Well, he went there and he preached. He preached with signs and wonders. He did signs and wonders, and many believed in in the in gospel truth to follow Jesus. But none had yet received the gift of the Holy Spirit. In fact, they even were baptized in water. Um, but and once Peter and John heard about this, they went to to make sure the Samaritans had what they had. I'm just checking with that. Yep. And, uh, and so Peter and John went to make sure the Samaritans had what they had. And as you can see there on the scripture, it says, when they arrived, they pray for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, when they did pray for them, laid hands on them, uh, it says they placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit in verse 18. Well, then we move to Acts chapter 9 and we see that Saul, the persecutor of the church, the, mur- the one who endorsed the murdering of Stephen, well, he was radically and suddenly converted. And, and, and he's believing, he's then waiting in a house, and, but he's not yet filled with the Holy Spirit. It was not until Ananias came and prayed for him and laid hands on him that he was then filled with the Holy Spirit. In uh, Acts 9.17, we read this where it says he went to the house and Ananias went into the house and entered it. He placed his hands on Saul and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I could go on and mention the believers in, in Ephesus, Acts Uh, in Ephesus and we read about them in Acts 19 verses 1 to 6. These were guys who believed in Jesus. Uh, Paul describes them as as disciples but they had a they again had a a baptism of repentance uh, into John's baptism and they hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit and so Paul then preached to them laid hands on them and then baptized them again but this time in the name of Jesus and and, he, and it tells us in the word, uh, in 19 verses 4 to 6, it says that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Now, I can also say that my testimony is similar to those scripture talk, uh, scripture moments that I've just read out. I grew up in the church. I gave my life to Jesus sometime in my childhood. I was water baptized. I repented of my sin. I was water baptized at 11. I went forward to receive Jesus then many times in my teenage years. But I was shy. I was lacking confidence in my relationship with God. And I was, and I was only filled with head knowledge about God. I never fully encountered the presence and the love and the person of the Holy Spirit till I was filled with him. And when I was 16, near the end of year 10, that took place. I was prayed for. And oh my goodness, I'd never felt anything like that before. The power, the love and the person of God just flooded my spirit. I had until that point never encountered the presence of God like that. I had never felt his power like that at any time before. I had never known his love like that at any time previous. I had never experienced the gifts of the Spirit like from that moment onwards. I had never felt such joy and boldness like that before. I knew I had received the promise that the Father and and I had entered the more of God. And I'd, ne- and I'd never felt that before. You see, our Christian faith It really is a journey of more, more than knowing scripture words, more than just principles of good living or leadership, more than a one off belief moment, more than even more than just a recognition that my sins are forgiven. Our faith is about the more of God, which is his person given to us in the Holy Spirit. 
the promised person of Pentecost. Have you met him? Have you met him? Well, you can today. Secondly, the person comes with power. In verse 8, it says, You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is in chapter 1 of Acts, verse 8. You receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And Paul said, when he went about preaching from town to town, he said, I didn't come to you with fancy words, but I came to you with the power of the gospel. And so like the fuel that fires up a V8 engine and takes you rumbling down a highway with wind blowing through your hair, the Holy Spirit, he is the fuel to your salvation faith. In fact, someone ignited faith in my heart when I was 16 just by asking me, do you want fuel for your faith? He said, your faith is like a V8 car and you will not know its power until you have its fuel. Do you want to know the power of God? Well, I answered, yes. But how? And he said, well, then get filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what sent me in then into a quest of seeking, searching and reading books and looking at the scriptures. You know, power in the Greek language means dunamis. It's actually the word where we get uh, we derive our word dynamite uh, from. And it means strength, power, ability. Power for performing miracles and power for moral living and the excellence of soul. It's a power that comes from within because of the one who resides in us. It's the same word that's used to describe the power that rose Jesus from the dead and which raises us up to be bold and to do mighty works for God. This power is to bring change. This power is to deliver souls from darkness. This power is to transform broken lives. This is power is to this power is to liberate us from bondage. This power is to heal the sick. You know, when I was in Nepal just recently, uh, one of the church planters, she was a lady, she came up to me and she said, Look, I've got pastor, I've got pain all in my fingers, down my shoulders and arms. And she said, could you pray for me? And uh, she said, I have so little strength and this pain never goes away. And you know what? I didn't know really what her problem was, but I was just willing to pray for her. And, uh, and so I prayed for her and nothing much seemed to be happening. So I stopped and I asked her, what's happening? She said, well, I'm feeling warmth coming down into my hands. And so, well, that encouraged me. So I prayed some more. And, you know, I, in that moment, I felt in my spirit, like the Holy Spirit say to me, arthritis, and that I need to rebuke it in Jesus' name. And so I did. And I, I said, I tell arthritis to go in the name of Jesus and pain to leave. And I, you know, in that instant, I felt power go come out of me and go through her body. And then instantly, she just collapsed on the ground. You know, this was no sort of courtesy fall that, well, maybe we see around town here from time to time. But this is this was because there was no clean carpet to fall on. She was going to fall. It was on to dry mud, a dirt floor. And that's where she went. And I tried to catch her awkwardly, but that's where she was. And we just continued praying for, for her. And then after a while, we lifted her up and we said, what's going on? And she said, she was just so excited. She said, all oh, the pain is gone. Look, I can move my arms and hands. And she was just so excited knowing that the power of God had entered her and she was now free from that pain. And as the Holy Spirit touched her. You know, this power to make things supernaturally happen, that could not naturally happen before. This is supernatural power that comes not from me, but from the Holy Spirit. You know, the late Reinhard Bonnke says from his book, Are We Flammable or Fireproof? A good title and a very encouraging book. He says, the Holy Spirit is not a super drug, a tranquilizer or a stimulant. He does not give us an emotional experience, but make no mistake about it. His presence is heart moving. Life is tough. God sends his power to people in tough situations. He is the original life force meant to empower us to live victoriously, abundantly, and to be a witness to the world. I like that statement. It really stirs my heart. 
You know what? But even more exciting than healing and more enriching than exercising any supernatural gift, I believe the power of the Holy Spirit is given to us to journey into the depths of God's love and grace and for us to, to, know, to know his love and to know the love that he has for people. Up until I was filled with the Spirit, I did not understand in my mind or feel in my heart the limitless extent of how much God loved me or others. But oh, when I was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, that changed everything. I'm going to read the Passion Translation and where Paul is praying for the transforming, powerful love of the Holy Spirit to touch every believer. This is what he says in Ephesians 3, 16 to 19. He says, And I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. Then by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Then you will be empowered to discover what every Holy One experience experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far reaching is his love. How enduring and in inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Oh, what wonderful expression of that prayer that Paul was praying for all of us. Friends, if we ever needed another Pentecost, it's now. If we ever needed an encounter with, the, with his, the power of his love, it is now. If ever we needed to know his, this love in a time of barrenness and isolation, it's now. Let your prayer be, come Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me in the power of your love. Come Holy Spirit, let a passion for you to burn within me again. Come, Holy Spirit, reside within us in power and person. You know, Ephesians 5 tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the meaning in the Greek language is that it's a continuous filling that just starts and never stops. And that we need to keep coming and asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I believe God wants us, wants us to position ourselves to be filled continuously. There is no pr problem with the Holy Spirit filling us as much as we want. It's continuous and it's constant. The problem is, though, it's, the problem is with us remaining under that waterfall of his glorious filling. We tend to move. He remains the same. He remains pouring out. But we tend to move. We tend to move away with our busyness. We tend to move away from that waterfall um, because of sin. We tend to move away in, because of apathy and distractions and prayerlessness. But he invites us back. Isaiah 44, 3 says, For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. You know, David, the king of Israel, had a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He was so aware that to be without the Holy Spirit, without the presence of God, he would be just like crushed up dry bones. He never wanted to be without the Holy Spirit. In fact, he prayed in Psalm 51. He says, um, he prays to God, he says, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Even though he sinned greatly, he was begging the Father, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He recognized that his own failings would cause the Holy Spirit to move away from him. And that really was the truth of the old covenant. 
But praise God for the new covenant that we have through Jesus Christ and his great grace for us. Because our good works or our bad works neither attracts nor detracts from the Holy Spirit's interest in our life. It is the Holy Spirit who actually continually invites us to abide with him as he is our grace gift, not our works reward. But we should never take Holy Spirit for granted, for he can be offended and can be grieved, especially through unbelief. Like any good relationship, our relationship with the Holy Spirit is cultivated through careful intention. When I consider my own life, especially in seasons like this, where a lot of the structure of my life and vision for the past 25 years has been disrupted in that we're not meeting on Sundays and everything just seems to be hurly-burly. You know, I, I'm being challenged as to the authenticity of my faith in the everyday. And sadly, to be honest, I find I'm exposed. I'm, I'm falling short in my own intensity and intention for my faith to grow and be expressed. But you know what? I have a growing hunger and a thirst to change this. I don't want to remain just because I'm disrupted to be confused in my faith and to be reliant on a Sunday meeting to keep me motivated and to keep me full of vision. I want to stay fresh and I want to stay empowered by his wonderful presence. And David teaches us a lot in regards to hungering and, and having a desire and having an intentional pursuit of the Holy Spirit. Listen to these words from Psalm 63 in the Passion Translation. This is a song that King David wrote while he was wandering around in the wilderness. And he said, O oh God of my life, I am lovesick for you in this weary wilderness. I thirst with the deepest longing to love you more, with cravings in my heart that cannot be described. Such yearnings grip my soul for you, my God. I'm energized every time I enter your heavenly sanctuary to seek more of your power and drink in more of your glory. Oh, these words. For your tender mercies mean more to me than life itself. How I love and praise you, God. Daily I will worship you passionately and with all my heart. My arms will wave to you like banners of praise. I overflow with praise when I come before you. For the anointing of your presence satisfies me like nothing else. You are such a rich banquet of pleasure to my soul. Oh God, oh, I just want to live the reality of those words. And so church, this is part one of my message on the power of Pentecost today and all that we really have time for in this week. But could I invite you, to, for you to know wherever you are, I'd like to invite you to pause and draw upon the person of the Holy Spirit. Right now, you can have an encounter with Holy Spirit. Right now, you, your soul can know the power of his love for you like never before. Right now, you can know his healing. And in fact, I, I just encourage you, if you've got pain in your body, anywhere right now why don't you just put your hand where that pain is I'm going to pray that pain has to leave your body I'm going to pray I'm going to speak healing over your body that there must be life and love that must be poured into your body right now because the spirit right now wants to touch you he wants to bring a freshness he wants to bring his power into your life to change you to transform you and so I speak right now that pain to leave your body right now in the name of Jesus I speak right now that all sickness must be go from your body right now and if you're dry and you're thirsty church I implore you look to him now lift your hands in an act of of, of surrender and receive his powerful love 
which he has promised to pour out on you. You see that love at Pentecost that was poured out, that power at Pentecost that was poured out, that's for you, your offspring, and for all those who are far off. Friends, that's you today. Lift your hands to heaven and say, come Holy Spirit, touch my life afresh. And Jesus said, he said, wait, wait, you will receive the gift of the Father, the power of the Holy Spirit. Will you wait upon him, church? Will you take time to draw aside, to come into that secret place and lift your hands and say, Holy Spirit, fill me today. Let a fresh Pentecost take place in my heart today. That's my prayer for you, church. That's my prayer for me, church, that we would seek his presence today. And so I'm going to pray for you. Lord God, let your spirit be poured out upon your church today. As your grace church meets wherever they are, whatever time today, Lord God, I pray that they would encounter you just like they, like the believers did on that first Pentecost. Lord, I pray that they would meet the person of the Holy Spirit and that they would know your power. Lord God, touch them afresh today like never before. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Come touch your people in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, church. Receive his love and power today.